Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's workshop, which uh, hopefully you can see on your screen in front of you is called the role of the supervisor. So um, this is one of my uh, my favourite uh, workshops that uh, that we do at, at IFAC, because this is really what when I'm not working with, uh, with IFAC, what I do as a, as a kind of a day job, if you like, I uh, my main role is to work with coaches and supervisors to actually help them fulfill their potential so that their advisors can be the best that they can be. So it's a, it's a subject of, uh, of massive interest to me, very passionate about it. And what I'm going to be doing over the course of the next couple of hours really is sharing some of my thoughts and observations from a best practice point of view. I know for a lot of you on the call, you're probably already very experienced supervisors so to that uh, intent, it will be a refresher of all the, uh, the skills and knowledge that we've got. But of course, never a good refresher never hurts. Remember our friend Stephen Covey, keep your saw sharp. <clears throat> so uh, with that in mind, uh, we've got a lot of attendees today. So thank you for your, uh, your, your support and, and attention. Let's, let's get on the way and, uh, and kick off with really just Overview, and as I say, for me, the uh, the supervisory role is probably the most or one of the most critical roles with, within a firm. As we know, it's all around uh, being the focal point for increasing the knowledge, skills, and overall effectiveness of advisors that you're working with. And it's a tough job, you know. It's, being a supervisor is not a, a straightforward role. You have to be an expert. You have to be an expert in uh, observing, not just in formal role, role play situations, but just observing the room, really, in terms of body language, managing relationships, keeping everybody motivated and, uh, and nipping uh, issues in the book before they rise. You have to be a great at assessing in a objective, a way and you also will need to be good at uh, training and coaching <clears throat> and you know we could all uh, try our hand at, at, at training and most of us on the call would be really good trainers any of us I guess on the call could run this this course today <clears throat> the thing that different differentiates uh, really highly effective supervisors are their ability to to move from training into coaching and when you're working with your experienced advisors in the team, moving more into a mentoring type role. And as I said, this, this role is important because it's the, it's the fulcrum around which two-way relationships are kind of built and maintained. So the information flows across the business. It's also critical in terms of ensuring that we're compliant and meeting the requirements of our TNC scheme. And we'll be talking about that in some depth as part of the, uh, the workshop. And of course, the, the punchline really is if we're working with our advisors, helping them fulfill their potential, increasing their overall effectiveness of them as individuals, as the team as a whole, then the great byproduct of that is better advice, consistent quality outcomes to all the clients that we're working with. <clears throat> and of course, this supervisory role is just a natural fit with the management of the business. And I know that some of you on the call will be um, you know, wearing a number of different hats. You'll be a director of your business um, who also has responsibility for the supervisory aspect of your, your, your firm as well. So it, 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 even if you're not in a direct role, you sort of quite always, for me, a supervisor is quasi-directorship anyway, because you should be working in partnership with the directorate um, and be naturally uh, round the ball table with them because you're an early warning system in lots of respects around the, uh, the advice and the back office part of the proposition. <clears throat> So in terms of what we're going to, to go through today together, as I say, we need to just sort of <clears throat> calibrate for around about two hours, which I know is, is a long time when you're sitting on the end of a Zoom call, but 
hopefully the, the content is engaging enough for us all to, to stick with it. So we're going to kick off the workshop really just by refreshing our understanding of what the key supervisory skills are. <clears throat> There'll be no surprises there. And we'll just, to a certain extent, briefly unpack those. We'll then dip into um, the nine key elements of the supervisory role, uh, where they fit, what they're intended to do. And then, as I say, we'll take the lid off sort of TNC supervision and really um, do some detail on that in terms of unpacking what effective TNC supervision might look like and the key role supervisors play in all of that. I'll introduce you or refresh your memories on something called the, the SID process. It's a really useful tool for supervisors to use, um, particularly when you're applying uh, the development cycle. So when you've done your needs analysis and when you're uh, trying to frame what the best types of interventions would be, for the advisors who you're supervising, then said it is, is a natural fit within the development cycle. <clears throat> I'll then spend some more time actually looking at the process of performance coaching. So we'll kind of step out of TNC and look at how we drive effectiveness and performance through a process of performance coaching. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sure you're all expert at that. And again, using the same concept of let's just refresh your memories. I'm going to share something called a positive reinforcement coaching technique, which you may already use, may be new to you. Some of you may use GROW. Uh, all, all are uh, good and valid models. But again, just worthwhile kicking the tires on that, making sure that <clears throat> we are doing everything we can do to be effective coaches. And then the final part of the session, we're just looking at how we facilitate effective working relationships. So a quick look at the different kind of personality styles that exist and how you may have to morph your approach to, to bring the best out of others. And a look at how we strike agreements with people in terms of how we're going to work together. <clears throat> so as you can see, quite a, quite a packed uh, agenda that we're going to follow. So let's, uh, let's kick off by just refreshing our memories on what the key supervisory skills are. As I said, there won't be any surprises here. Very straightforward stuff. You'd expect a supervisor to really be quite a good communicator, whether that's uh, verbally, uh, written, um, uh, and be able to flex their communication style appropriately you know, to, uh, to the best effect. As I said as part of my opening comments, you'd expect a supervisor to be really good at observing what's happening, whether that be in a role play situation, whether it be body language in a meeting, whether it be what's happening in the room, the non-verbals as much as the verbals. You'd also expect a supervisor to be an expert at assessing performance. So if we think about the most natural uh, part of that, it would be the TNC process, observing our advisors are fit and proper as we do our annual MOTs on them or bringing people through to competent advisor status through the onboarding and induction process to really be clear about what the assessment criteria are, how people can uh, achieve those criteria and be skilled at packaging up and giving feedback to people so that that lands with them in a way that they can understand and in a way in which they feel motivated to go and do something about it in terms of acquiring knowledge, changing behaviour, or sometimes you have to deal with some attitudinal issues. <clears throat> Supervisors, in my uh, view, all roads should, should lead to them in terms of you know, people development within, within a firm. So I'm sure a lot of you um, do what I'm doing this morning and you pull your people together and you run sort of training sessions for them, updates and briefings in terms of what they need to do. You might well do that as a group. You might decide you're going to do that on a one-to-one -one basis. <clears throat> and you also need to be a skilled and expert coach as well. 
over and above just being skilled at assessing and feedback, it's important that you can monitor performance. So again, you'll have your own kind of key performance indicators that are important to you in your firm. So it's not just about uh, being there on the spot to watch people working. You'll have a suite of PPI, I'm sure, that you can use to monitor performance, uh, you know, or, or the usual suspect will apply there in terms of every dashboard. I won't uh, teach Granny how to suck eggs there. <clears throat> and of course, you need to be skilled and expert at record keeping. You know, the, the old mantra that I'm sure that your IF, IFAC consultant kind of um, regularly reminds you of, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist, whether that's an internal audit or whether that's our friends at the FCA. So meticulous record keeping, particularly in terms of bringing uh, people through to competent status and then being able to evidence their ongoing com uh, competence that they're fit and proper. Not just your own record keeping, <clears throat> but also being a role model for others in terms of setting expectations about how they record things like their ongoing continuing professional development, making sure that you treat that seriously so that they in turn treat it seriously. I think there's an old phrase that uh, one of my ex-managers which used to use with me, uh, that that is inspected is respected. And I think uh, there's a lot of truth in that. <clears throat> so as I say, no, no surprises there. I'm just gonna quickly unpack each of those in turn. In terms of communication, as I've said, not only good oral skills, but good written communication skills as well. So that if you're framing something like a performance development plan or setting smart objectives, advisors really are crystal clear on what's expected of them, will your role in that and what needs to be done. <clears throat> the other key skill around communication is to not always be in broadcast mode. Yeah, absolutely key is the ability to listen to what's being said and sometimes listen between the lines and to ensure two good way communication between you and your advisors and cross and up into the business. <clears throat> and often much overlooked in terms of communication is that ability to read the nonverbal clues, the body language. Now, uh, I've read various kind of reports that up to 80% of how we communicate is actually down to body language rather than the words we say. Um, so being expert in interpreting body language, looking for clusters and, and being able to uh, mirror body language uh, on occasions. <clears throat> and of course, when you're a supervisor, you're always a role model, you're always on display. So being cognizant of your own body language so that you're giving off a very positive kind of frame and demeanor that uh, other people <coughs> can observe themselves. Around observation skills, it's been very fair with the observation aids. Um, I'll be looking at some of the aids available to you through, through IFAC. You maybe have your own in-house uh, observation aids. But, you know, they are basically the tools of your trade. Uh, if you're a professional golfer, you've got your set of clubs. Um, you're a professional supervisor. One of your clubs, I would suggest, is your observation aid, aids. And you must be totally familiar in, out, back to front, understand every line of those. <clears throat> and then in terms of that skill in observe, observing, it's to be able to capture words uh, what happened in terms of behavior in real time and that is a real skill to be able to stay in the moment stay in the meeting so that you can actually um, capture and record in real time what what is happening <clears throat> then to be able to calibrate where an advisor is relative to their peers an absolutely critical um, skill in terms of observation. So being able to exercise your own judgment, drawing on your experience to say, right, I've got a team of 10 advisors. 
one of my favorite consultancy questions when I'm working with firms as, and, and supervisors and say, you've got a team here, you've got half a dozen people in your team, let's do a hierarchy. Who's your number one? Who's your number six? Tell me why there's one to six. Describe to me why you're ranking this individual as advisor number four. Give me chapter and verse on it. So that ability to have used your observation, your wisdom, your judgment, your acumen to accurately calibrate advisors relative to peers. <clears throat> and then critical, and this is kind of the sharp end that uh, advisors see really, is when they're being assessed and when you're giving feedback. And that, why, that's why it's so critical to um, depersonalize it to an extent and be totally objective in terms of what you're looking for and be very consistent. When I'm working in, in firms, one of the uh, grumbles I get uh, sometimes from advisors is a lack of consistency from the supervisor. So in terms of the assessment and feedback process, it's always to be consistent with how you're assessing, how you're objectively capturing information and the way in which you're giving feedback. <clears throat> and of course, critical to this is about being able to understand where the advisor needs to improve to create more effectiveness in the process and the way in which you believe is the best intervention to help with that performance improvement. So I've said from a training and development point of view, um, you know, be a, be a focal point for the business. Part of your responsibilities is under training and development is to be able to do training needs analysis. And later on in the workshop, we'll be looking at the development cycle and how you might use something like SID process to, to do that, because it's critical that we identify the most appropriate kind of learning interventions. <clears throat> You need to be capable of delivering training yourself. And I know everybody on the call will, will be. Or sometimes you might make the call that this is better served by doing it through a third party, such as myself. And you'll bring somebody into what a specific development event or series of events for you because you know you, you truly believe that's the best approach. The other thing that you need to be able to do from a, from a training and development perspective is to demonstrate to the advisors that you have relevant knowledge and be able to demonstrate the skills you're expecting of them. Yeah. So <clears throat> in terms of monitoring performance, um, be very really explicit about the gap between where the advisor is now and where they actually need to be in terms of whether it's a mandatory T TNC point or whether indeed it's a, a non-mandatory effectiveness point where you believe they, they could still work on that skill and behaviour to improve overall performance. <clears throat> and when you're setting um, targets and standards, it's really critical that they're clear, they're very understandable so uh, and they're smart so that people know what they need to do, how they're going to be measured, and the time in which they've got to do that. <clears throat> and you need to be able to measure performance, as we know, around expected performance criteria, whether that's knowledge, skills, and behaviours. You may use something like the IFAC form. You, you probably, a lot of you on the call, have your own in-house standards, Particularly, I find when I'm working with firms around the behaviours. So you'll have your own kind of uh, values, how you want uh, interactions with clients to be. Um, you'll want that obviously to be um, mirrored throughout the whole uh, advisory population. And uh, that's what you need to do around calibrated performance and setting standards and targets. The other key skill is to weave it together so that uh, you and your advisors aren't working on a series of kind of copied industries and products outwit of day-to-day -day business. So the smart supervisory approach is to say, right, how can I kind of weave this in, align it to day-to-day -to -day activities 
so that we're not creating additional workload for everybody. Yeah. So it may be that you've got somebody who you've taken through to CAS who you really believe, you know, you've, you've done a little bit of coaching, but you know there's somebody in your team who's particularly good at that part of, let's say, a fact-finding meeting. <clears throat> so you could you could tag somebody along to observe that meeting and just learn by observation in terms of how that's that's done. I've talked about record keeping. It's uh, you know a visible kind of sign of you at work and your overall effectiveness. And it's about you being able to show that your advisor de development is adhering to the TNC scheme and also that your advisors within your remit are able to evidence when required CPD. The other part of it is to be able to recognise advisor achievements and celebrate success, you know, whether it's achieving cast status, whether it's uh, achieving a milestone in part of their personal development plan, um, writing a certain volume of business, client feedback, you know, you are pivotal to educating and informing the business and sharing that kind of good news about uh, an advisor's role uh, and their performance. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm conscious really that there's nothing new there. It's, uh, there were no kind of uh, shocks or surprises, I think, in terms of the key advisory skills, all very straightforward, nothing that you won't uh, have covered before. That was just really to kind of refresh us and get us all on, on the same page. <clears throat> the next stage is to say, okay, so, Let's have a look at the key elements then of a supervisory role. What is my kind of job description, if you like, from a supervisory perspective? So as we know, key element of it is supervision around TNC. So it's continuing professional development. The elements that typically make that up are the way that you, uh, you know, probably been involved in the recruitment process i always with the firms i'm working with say it's great to have your supervisors in at the recruitment process they can help you identify the right raw material they can help you identify somebody's intrinsic motivations and whether or not they feel they'll be a good fit for the business and respond well to uh, moving through development <clears throat> so if they're not an existing advisor uh, you'll have to start from scratch. Typically, these days, we tend to recruit people who are already diploma qualified. Maybe we've managed to tempt them from another company, but they'll still have to be onboarded uh, to be um, go through the cultural process and the advisory processes that are live in your firm, which will be different. So we need to take them through that process, get them through to... Uh, competence, maintain competence, and, it's, and, and maintain that uh, professional development. <clears throat> the other key strand is your ability to, to coach. Um, because a supervisor is all about not just TNC, but ensuring that everybody within our care as supervisors is able to fulfill their potential. That's kind of that the magic of what we do in our role. So how do we do that? We, as, as we've said in the previous slides, we have to be able to role model that. We have to be able to demonstrate what good looks like from an advisory point of view, from a record keeping and paperwork point of view. We have to observe people at work or in a role play situation, and we have to give them feedback. <clears throat> now, in in businesses that I work with, there's one big business I work with. It's a national, a national business that specialises in wealth management, not an IFA business. It's, a, it's an AR business. Um, they actually set their supervisors actually separate this out. So they do TNC observations and feedback. And then once a month in the early days, and that falls back to once a quarter and then sometimes uh, twice a year or annually, they do um, performance development coaching sessions. So something maybe to, to think about. And then finally, as I said, you are the really the oil 
in the engine for me around managing relationships, keeping harmony within the firm, um, not being a soft touch because, you know, you have to confront performance issues and make sure that those are addressed. But this is about managing relationships because ultimately we're not a charity. What we're here to do is to drive the business forward. We need to keep growing our business. We grow our business but by being by offering great client service, having a great portfolio of products and servicing uh, our clients so that they stay with us and they provide the phones. <clears throat> the way we manage relationships, lots of different ways that we can do that, but it's about really trying to get to understand, as you know, your people as just as well as you can. Uh, you no doubt we've written some, uh, read some uh, leadership books on, on this subject. Uh, there's many around, but try some, some sports books as well. You know, try Alex Ferguson's book, try Clive Woodward's book. Oh, you know, it all talks about their success was around managing relationships, knowing what makes each individual tick is key critical and how you weld that into kind of the team ethos and ethic to drive the business forward. <clears throat> so we've got what we're going to do with those nine elements is we're going to spend some time on, on each of those, uh, giving them a little bit more focus. We're going to do that in a, a relatively structured way. So remember that first set was all around kind of making sure that everything is where it needs to be in terms of standard setting and assessing performance within our TNC scheme. <clears throat> now, some of you will be using the, uh, the TNC scheme that IFAC have created. Some of us, some of you I know, will have your own internal TNC scheme. <clears throat> and I would suggest that you know you again are um, probably the owner of that and uh, help bring it to life. Um, not wanting to, uh, to, to insult you, but just setting us off somewhere any TNC scheme, whatever firms you read, will typically make the following commitments. It will say that all our advisors are competent. Well, no surprises there. It will also then talk about in what way they're appropriately supervised and will make a series of commitments within the scheme to demonstrate how that is um, going, to, you know, going to be carried out. And it will also articulate how uh, advisors uh, and other uh, key performance indicators are reviewed to ensure that all advisors are remaining competent. <clears throat> and when you dig into the FCA guidance and try and get a handle on what they what their definition of confident competence is, all it talks to is about having the right skills, knowledge, and expertise to do the job that they're being asked to do. So, you know, if somebody isn't qualified in say, I don't know, pension transfers or equity release, then obviously we wouldn't expect them to do that. But if they're in the kind of wealth management space, we'd expect them to have level four and be able to advise a portfolio of products within that space and be able to evidence that they've got that expertise. And then also our width of that, that they continually operate having good standards of ethical behavior. And I would suggest that that's kind of be, uh, very much in, intrinsic to your own firm values, um, the kind of service proposition that uh, you believe is important to your particular clients. So quite a lot going on there in terms of being able to assess and to demonstrate that advisors remain competent. <clears throat> so I said, I would expect you would be either the architect or certainly the owner and gatekeeper of the TNC scheme in your role. Uh, we've talked about standards. Um, you know, there are no hard and fast standards outside things like principles and the handbook. So you can decide standards that you know, your firm wants to use from a TNC perspective. You must be clear about what your minimum standards are, you know, so what's the baseline level of standards and be able to articulate what is acceptable 
and equally important, what isn't acceptable. <clears throat> Within all of that, in terms of formulating standards, do consider not just hitting the minimum level, but consider what best practice might look like. But that comes with a little bit of a health warning for me, because <clears throat> when you're sitting and trying to frame your TNC scheme and framing standards. Obviously, you're very proud, very committed to the firm. You want to give excellent service. And there is a tendency to want to gold plate if you're not careful, your TNC scheme. Um, just be careful when you're doing that because that could well be a stick that's used to beat you in the future. By all means, go to exceed a client's expectations, but there's no need to frame that within your TNC scheme and gold plate it. <clears throat> By all means, have some best practice in there and don't just head for minimum standards. So frame your standards appropriately. Anything over and above that though, I suggest you could do it in a slightly different way in terms of wrapping it up in your um, customer outcomes kind of um, statements that you want to make. <clears throat> so in terms of TNC supervision, when you frame the standards that you want for your business, as I say, whether you're just merely going to import IFAC or whether you're going to you know, build your own, um, part of your role is to make sure that your advisors are absolutely crystal clear on what the requirements of the TNC scheme are from a knowledge, skills and behaviours perspective. <clears throat> and that will, of course, differ depending on where they are on their development journey. So one of the things I do when I'm working with a new advisor and bringing them up to, to CAS is to say, right, this is how your development journey kind of maps out and this is why it's so important, We're kind of committed to this in our TNC scheme, yeah? Talk to them about how you measure and calibrate them, their performance against the TNC criteria. Share things like the observation aids with them. They shouldn't be a secret. They're not a mystery. They're not something you have hidden in your folio as you're watching them kind of at work. You'll be all open and, and, and visible, and they should understand each of the point, the mandatory and non-mandatory points within your observation aid. And talk to them about the, um, the MI that you're going to be using, your dashboard that uh, keeps an eye on uh, your compliance with, with TNC. <clears throat> Have processes in place to evidence. So it is about evidencing both attaining and maintaining ongoing compliance. What do you need to think about? Well, I guess the bottom line is, if somebody were to parachute into your business on one of the and say, okay, I want to take your TNC scheme into a room and read it kind of back to back, then I'm going to come out and I'm going to ask you for all your records and evidence that you are in a holistic way adhering to all the requirements of your TNC scheme. Yeah. <clears throat> Could you be really confident that you have robust processes and systems in place, not just for a trainee to re reach competence, but for maintaining ongoing competence and adhering to your TNC scheme uh, as well. You know, if you were scoring yourself out of 10, where would you be? I know, and if you're a seven or eight out of 10, where would you need to be to make you a 10 out of 10 so that you can do that? <clears throat> and as I say, um, lest we get too, too much of a kind of a loving and think supervision is all about being soft and fluffy and development, developmental. There does need to be robust places in place for an advisor that for whatever reason, either fails to reach or cannot maintain the required standards. So part, the other side of a supervisory coin, if you like, is sometimes to take people down the performance improvement plan and where for whatever reason, uh, performance isn't meeting the required standards to move on to the next stage, which is unfortunate but required, which is to start the um, 
the disciplinary process. So if we can't manage up, part of the TNC supervisory role is to manage out. And that's where your record keeping does actually become key critical. <clears throat> so as part of our TNC scheme, at some time, we are going to have an investment uh, as assessment event. You know, whether that's with your newbies who are going through to competent status, or whether that's with your more experienced advisors, where you're needing to do your kind of annual fit and proper, your uh, your check in with them to make sure everything is is where it needs to be. <clears throat> now, again, uh, I'm very conscious that your experienced supervisors are, are on the line. Um, and don't want to teach granny how to suck eggs. But again, part of what I can do this morning is to share some insights with you. So, as I say, a, a big part of my uh, consultancy work is to work in a big business with supervisors, and that is that is their role, full-time supervisors of a team of advisors. So you think they'd have no distractions, nothing else to do. <clears throat> Part of what I do is I talk to their advisory team about their experience, how it is for them. So I can gather feedback on the supervisor's performance because ultimately I need to sign the supervisor off as being competent in their particular role. And from time to time, I do hear advisors say, well, my supervisor came in to do an assessment, but he, won't, he or she was not that prepared. They kind of uh, rushed in from a telephone call. Uh, the meeting kind of got on the way and they were kind of scrubbing around doing their paperwork. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting that ever happens to anybody on the call, <clears throat> but you must take time out to, to prepare and get ready for the observation. So it's golden time that making sure that when the observation starts, that uh, you're ready. So build that time into your diary, plan it, it's golden time. Don't take that unscheduled phone call unless it, it, there's absolutely no way around it and kind of get organised, yeah? I'm coaching some uh, three people on Tuesday. Uh, I actually did my paperwork to get ready on that uh, yesterday afternoon because that's the only sort of time I had available. Now, I'm not saying that to big myself up. I'm just saying... You've got to practice what you preach, haven't you, really? So I'm organised. I'm ready to go for Tuesday. The other thing to do is to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's getting observed. Again, the feedback I get is whoever experienced the advisor is, they really could do without it. You know, they really don't like being observed. Who does? Yeah. So this is about you really taking the time and trouble rather than launching straight in the, uh, the assessment event and doing an observation just to position it with them yeah just to remind them of the standards to give them a chance to actually talk to you uh, to understand what they're looking to achieve from the meeting because that really will give you some specifics to look for in the observation and would be important in terms of framing your feedback to them. <clears throat> so when you're observing, this is a real challenge. And I know myself, you know, I've observed some fact find meetings that have gone on you know, well over two hours. And it is a real challenge, I know, to kind of stay with it, to, to be present, to stay in the, in the room, as it were. Uh, and not to suddenly, uh, ah, I think I might have just missed something that might have been quite important there. So it is a real skill to focus in, but monitor, record. It's the, the way I, I think about it when I go in and do these events, it's about I'm there to be a video camera, if you like. Or I've got to uh, be there and record verbatim by what I see, by what I hear what's actually happening in this, this meeting. And then when it comes to feedback, to exercise my judgment in terms of, based on my plan, based on my position and the standards I'm there to observe, in what way am I going to use the meticulous notes and record keeping that I've taken to frame the feedback? Because the feedback typically will be about agreeing a way forward, typically around something like a personal development plan, and that, that then informs 
the next event. So there needs to be some sort of a link and a replan to the cycle. So <clears throat> the, I would suggest that the white boxes outside of the blue boxes are probably the most important. Yeah, we all know what the track we need to follow is, but the challenge is to be disciplined enough to do everything we need to do either within or between those different stages to make that uh, assessment event the very best it can be in a professional way. <clears throat> so I started talking about the, the, the T&C assessments and the absolute criticality of paying attention. So as I say, this is about being the video recorder. Watch what's going on, listen to what's happening. When you're watching, you're watching both the uh, behaviours, body language, you're looking for verbal cues, nonverbal clues, etc. So <clears throat> could you describe what the person you were assessing were doing when they did it within the meeting? Could you actually say, you know, we're 20 minutes into the meeting, can you remember da 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 what happened? how they actually did it, they'd be very descriptive. Remember, this is the visual part of, um, of the video recording. You know, in what way did they use their body language? What was their eye contact like? What about their hand movements? You know, were they, did they look like they were engaged with the client or were they distracted by something else that was happening? <clears throat> the active listening skill here, absolutely critical. So, actually use the words that they use wherever possible. So what did they say? But then use your, again, skill to try and make a note of how they said it. So did the words, did the music kind of add up? Were they using the right words, but it came out as if they were a bit bored and fed up? You know, this is the fourth fact-finding meeting of the day and I'm a bit kind of uh, fact-finded out, yeah? <coughs> but it's the client's first fact meeting of the day, so you need to be kind of honest. <clears throat> what they were saying, remember we're doing TNC here, was it accurate? Was it within the scope, the framework of what we're able to say? Uh, were there any omissions from what they needed to say in terms of a disclosure perspective? And did it make sense? You know, at the end of the day, we've got a client at the end of this, whether that's role play or whether it's live, would it be reasonable to for somebody to understand what was being said to them by the advisor at any particular point in the meeting? Or was the advisor checking in to test that understanding? In what way did they know the client kind of got it, really? <clears throat> and then, as I say, it's about being able to use the observation forms. This is just a, um, a capture of a form that IFAC would provide to you. This is for a protection assessment. So from your point of view as a supervisor, whether it's an IFAC form or whether it's one that you use for yourself, you need to be an expert on the definition of competence. So what does competence look like? How would you describe that to somebody if you needed to do so without just using the words on the form? <clears throat> Are you clear and is your uh, coachee, person you're observing clear on what is mandatory, i.e. part of the TNC scheme, and what is non-mandatory? <clears throat> and a non-mandatory isn't particularly a, a, you know, a nice to have, the mandatories are normally where we're starting to talk about being effective in the meeting. And are we using the right you know, observation aid? So this is a protection observation aid for someone aid for somebody who's working in that market. So it'd be wholly inappropriate to be trying to use this document for somebody who's about to go in and talk to a wealth client. Yeah. <clears throat> in terms of this form, as I say, this is something that is uh, one of your key tools as a supervisor. So in what way are you able to gain and uh, document the necessary evidence? Now that could be through observation. So it's what you've seen, what you've heard within the meeting. But as you know, it is totally legitimate to question 
an advisor, yeah? And then document down what they're saying about how they would have approached that part of the meeting and why they did what they did. <clears throat> and it's about making sure that the evidence is uh, right type and right quality. So, you know, it's about using your professional judgment and discretion to say, this is important, this is less important. This is this evidence fits into this box. So no good, you know, if you're getting your evidence mixed up and get it in the wrong boxes, that's that's a problem always around in terms of evidence and competence and then framing the feedback. And is it top quality? Is it objective? Are you using verbatim words that are being said? <clears throat> and you know, how well are you able to exercise judgment based only on, on the evidence? And again, just some insight with you from things I've seen uh, in the recent past with supervisors I've been working with, sometimes they've got a bit of, uh, subjective. <clears throat> so they said like something like, um, when you're doing the first part of the disclosure within a uh, fact find meeting, uh, I think that it should be like this. And it's like, whoa, whoa that's very subjective. <laughs> uh, you, need, you need to be going back to the evidence and say, this is what you said. Yeah, and then we're moving later, probably into more of a coaching uh, input. <clears throat> the other thing you need to be clear on in terms of observing meetings is what constitutes a pass. So if you're going to take somebody through a full observation, then these are the IFAC standards. <clears throat> and I suggest that probably yours would be uh, the same. If not, they'd be very, very similar. So <clears throat> it's OK not to be uh, fully uh, competent in terms of mandatory if you can pass somebody with some development points. Yeah. And again, that's about you using your discretion. And what you would normally do is talk to the advisor afterwards. It may just have been that it was a simple slip of admission. They know they've kind of screwed up, if you like, and they knew what the right answer was. So you can pass them with development. But no more than three mandatory areas from an IFAC point of view can be graded pass with development. <clears throat> and you can't have any failures whatsoever in a, in a blue box in a mandatory area which I think is fairly self-explanatory. We wouldn't want to be letting our advisors loose if they couldn't even pass with uh, the development. <clears throat> and finally, you know, if they've got um, the, the non-mandatory areas are important, but you know, no more than five non-mandatory either failed or passed with development, which would be fairly hard to do, I think, if you're, if, if you're being let loose with clients or in a role play. And of course, you know, you don't always, you're not always with a client, you're not always doing the role play. You can do um, assessments with the explain to me sort of criteria. So, you know, you can talk through a minimum of two mandatory areas and, and they don't fail them. <clears throat> so, again, building on this point about capturing evidence and taking notes. When you're capturing evidence, you're recording it down, be very specific about what you, see, what you saw, what did you hear. Use the actual words. Remember, you're a video. What did I see? What did I hear? What are the actual words that I used? <clears throat> Try and maintain a good balance throughout the meeting uh, where that is uh, applicable. You know, don't kind of focus in on the first bit of the meeting, kind of drift off and think about other work-related matters during the, uh, the middle of the meeting, then tune back in. Have a balance. <clears throat> also have a balance of what you saw, and what you heard as well in equal measure. It's key to remain objective and not be subjective, as we know. So avoid your own opinions and be descriptive yeah this is what i saw you do this is what i heard you say these are the words not this is what i think or you should do this and the key skill within all of this and to be highly effective is to be able to do this in real time so it's to document the evidence and kind of be writing up your observation form as you go whilst you're still tuning in to the meeting it's a real skill as uh, as you know, 
<clears throat> and it's about making it as um, clear and as concise as possible. Yes, the form could be scrutinized either through an IFAC internal audit, or maybe if you're unlucky through some sort of FCA inspection visit. So <clears throat> would, every, would everybody be able to pick that document up and understand exactly what that document has actually captured and um, it be clear in terms of the, uh, the language that's been used. <clears throat> Still talking about the feedback process, once we've captured all that evidence, the most important uh, part of gaining that uh, change to knowledge or behaviour is about to come, which is the feedback session. So it's really important that you're able to categorise the information. So as I said, <clears throat> as you're going through the meeting, looking at your mandatories and non-mandatories, sometimes, you know, only, wouldn't it be great if things came out in sequential order? That would be fantastic. But unfortunately, they don't typically. So you have to skip through <clears throat> and, uh, and categorise, look for clusters of behaviours and, uh, and knowledge. And from that, from that categorisation, that should relatively straightforwardly lead you to believe there are there's some real strengths here. <clears throat> These are some areas that you just need to keep repeating because um, you're very strong in these areas. And people like to hear that. They like to hear what they're good at. And also, here's some areas where we need to think about how you're going to develop, yeah? How are you going to improve? <clears throat> and of course, particularly with your newer starters, the people who have maybe coming up to competent advisor status or getting to grips with uh, a new firm, it's about having some sense of prioritization, really. Um, most people in terms of behavioral change can only cope with two, maybe three things at any one time. So it's, it's critical, part of your role is to prioritize what needs to be done. So if it's development uh, and reinforcement areas, maximum of two per area. So keep doing this, keep doing that, and two areas for development. But of course, anything around a mandatory area, as you know, has to be a number one priority. So we need to uh, make that crystal clear. And I suggest that part of our preamble before we even start the observation, you know, <clears throat> first and foremost, we're here to uh, focus in, making sure, you know, you're, you're fit and proper from a compliance point of view. Yeah, if for whatever reason, even when we go through explain to me, I think some development, that's gonna take priority. Anything over and above that, we'll be looking at separately. And again, this is all about having the right level of balance. <clears throat> again, some insights I've seen from uh, less effective supervisors, they've kind of gone straight into uh, the development. They've ignored uh, much of the good stuff that's, that's kind of um, gone off. And it's almost been like uh, a bit like visiting a GP. They've kind of rattled off a prescription and said, you know, Take, take this three times a day and improve your compliance around this area and get better sort of thing. Now, I, I overemphasize to, uh, to illustrate a point there, and I'm sure nobody on this call does that, but it is about having the right level of balance. So we're not demotivating somebody, we're recognizing their strengths, and therefore they'll be more committed to work on their development areas. <clears throat> So just as we, we uh, start to conclude on this, this TNC element of the workshop then, <clears throat> in terms of help and support, as a supervisor, uh, what you're really looking for, particularly for uh, new advisors to roll, is the right raw material. So are you confident that any recruitment processes within your firm are geared up to identify the right people? Yeah, because if you get the right raw material in, you've got a far better chance of bringing them through to uh, effectiveness um, in a way that benefits them, yourself and the business and ultimately the client in a very timely way. So <clears throat> if you're not already, I kind of insist that you were included in any recruitment that the firm does. 
maybe just worthwhile for those of you who are bringing in new people, either inexperienced or experienced advisors to your business, just looking at your onboarding and induction process, uh, do your own internal audit on it, if, if you like, how confident are you? It might be some while, maybe. Typically, you know, we go through periods of stability, and then hopefully because the business is, is growing, we need to bring in some, uh, some, some new blood, some new resources. So dust down that uh, onboarding and induction process. Is it fit for purpose? You know, can it be refined and tuned up in any way? <clears throat> What are you doing to ensure your advisors are maintaining competence? You know, are you just relying on them recording some CPD time? Um, are you taking an interest in that in terms of quality of CPD interventions? You know, if somebody's file suggests they're just reading things like pink papers, then I would start to get a little worried about evidence in that as a CPD. And what do you think your role is? And uh, again, a lot of supervisors I work with tend to pedal back a bit from the more experienced advisors and kind of leave them well alone. <clears throat> but somebody who's effective in the role, it's less of a stretch to make them highly effective. And, uh, you know, some time spent with them can really benefit them, their client and the business as well. <clears throat> a plug for, uh, for IFAC, you know, how can they help? Well, they can assist with recruitment, they can assist with supervisor training. So this is a this is a workshop really that's just imparting lots of uh, information. But I know that they will actually come to the uh, to your firm and work with you on a one to one basis and uh, kind of see you at work and uh, and coach you as a supervisor. <clears throat> they will uh, assist you in supervision of your uh, your advisors if that's what you want. As I say, that's kind of what I do, really. I work with at supervisory level uh, with, with managers of teams to make sure they are the best they can be for their advisors. And they can validate any training that's been undertaken by yourself or by any third parties that, uh, that have been engaged. <clears throat> and the good news is that you're not on your own. I've referenced it a few times during the, uh, the workshop so far. But there is a TNC manual that you can uh, you can draw down. I had a look at it. I think last week is uh, it's really good actually. So if you've not looked at the uh, the IFAC TNC manual for a while, if you just go into the BAT system, go into documents and type in TNC manual, you'll be able to uh, to download that. Uh, and if nothing else, if you're not using that already, um, it's a refresher, or you can compare and contrast it with the TNC scheme that you've got in place. Uh, in your business, just to make sure that uh, there aren't any uh, inadvertent gaps. Okay, <clears throat> so that was the kind of the, the first block, really, of the key elements of supervision. What I want to dip into now is to look at the uh, next block, really, which was around how we kind of develop our advisors, how we keep them where we need to have them from a developmental point of view. So, <clears throat> as I said, a supervisor, one of the key uh, skills a supervisor needs to have is the ability to do uh, a training needs analysis. So the training needs analysis sits there, it's the purple block within the slide there which is one element of the development cycle that you uh, need to be expert in. <clears throat> and for the training needs analysis, I'm gonna go through a very simple SID process for you. <clears throat> We're then gonna move on to look at how you would uh, use different learning styles to frame a personal development plan, then look at coaching, and then look at how we kind of embed all of this uh, good stuff so we get uh, performance improvement, behavioural shift. <clears throat> so let's start with the, the SIG process. Really, really straightforward, uh, like most good tools are. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we're not, uh, that we're treating the right thing in terms of we're doing our needs analysis here. What's actually happening here? So this is like identifying the outputs, which might show that against 
KPIs or performance targets, somebody is performing well, or somebody might have some uh, perform underlying performance issues. So it could be from <clears throat> your, you know, uh, things like complaints, customer complaints, something's called from your dashboard around persistency, whatever. Yeah. So you're looking at what are the outputs that are, tend uh, are getting me to think that maybe we've got an underlying weakness here. <clears throat> and then it's all about saying, OK, um, that's just a high level symptoms diagnosis. But it's a bit like me uh, waking up in the morning and, uh, you know, my, I'm covered in, you know, red spots, for example. So that's that's a simple. But what is actually causing it? So what, what you know? Have I got measles? Have I got what have I got? Chicken pox? I don't know. So that's where we need to do some investigation at that stage. And it's exactly the same when you're a supervisor doing a training needs analysis. So you're saying, okay, got something here on the dashboard that's showing me that maybe the outputs aren't exactly where they need to be. So what's going on here? I need to do an investigation. And that's where you look at treating causes rather than symptoms. So what's the causal effect here? What are the impacts that are going on that's creating those particular outputs? And that might be hard facts, hard data, or it might be soft. It might be more of a behavioral piece. Yeah. Uh, and that's really uh, down to you being kind of a, a detective and uh, really focusing in and exploring what could be the underlying causes of uh, of those uh, outputs. In terms of helping with the diagnosis, you can split it down hopefully into uh, three key areas. The easy one is knowledge. So you can look at an advisor's qualifications. So you know if they've got their level four diploma, if they're in the mortgage space, you know that it's level three, uh, CMAP qualified. <clears throat> so you can check their qualifications. And it's very easy to, to check their technical expertise through um, quizzes and tests and just through discussion to make sure that everything is where it needs to be from a technical perspective and understanding. Also, you can, you know, advise quality from case checks. It's probably not something you do in your day-to-day -day role. We can get a feed in from the, uh, the case checking team in terms of what advice quality is looking like and if there are any uh, consistent themes that are emerging. And you can also, by regular inspection of their CPD file, look at the kind of events they're attending to keep their knowledge uh, current and, and up to date. If you want to check out from a skills perspective in terms of your diagnosis when you're doing this investigation, well, it's, it's really easy to set up a, a role play. You know, that's kind of what you're there for. If, if you want to check out, it doesn't have to be a full blown kind of fact find or presentation meeting. You can chunk it down and do one particular section of the meeting and uh, see what's going on there. Obviously, it's not to say that uh, you can't go into live meetings. It, live meetings are good because sometimes some of the feedback I get, if I'm observing an advisor, say, and uh, signing them off as confident, they say, well, of course, Jeremy, um, I know this was a role play. I would never do that at a live meeting. Um, surprising <coughs> that because when you see them in a live meeting, typically they do. <laughs> so, um, you know, Live meetings can be used, totally legitimate. Again, you could just focus on a particular part of it or the whole thing. Never underestimate the value of client feedback. You know, ask the client how it was for them, what went well, what they thought could be better from uh, the advisor uh, performance point of view. And also, you get to say, looking at your dashboard of metrics there, your KPIs, how they're doing against not just business targets, but maybe against um, targets you've given them in terms of their own personal development. And then uh, one that's slightly more difficult to, uh, to diagnose because this is typically kind of um, intrinsic to an individual, but you know, <clears throat> how aligned are they 
in, from uh, their own internal value set to the values of the firm. Yeah. How aligned are their personal goals, and what they're all trying to achieve to the performance of the business and the outputs and outcomes you're looking for from the business, for your clients and from your business performance. If there's a misalignment there, that, that as you know, can be an issue. The more aligned they are, the better it will be. Which links us right back to that recruitment process, bringing people in with the right uh, attitude around their own personal values and goals, which are aligned to the firm, makes for a much more straightforward uh, onboard induction and ongoing development process. <clears throat> so again, you're all expert supervisors. There's nothing that's uh, new there. I've told you, it's just kind of refreshing. And I've introduced this concept of SIS. When you're at the training needs analysis uh, stage, trying to work out what development interventions would be best. Look at, uh, look at you know, the outputs, go into detail on the inputs, and then, you know, what's your diagnosis? Break it down into knowledge, skills, and attitude, because that will help you frame what intervention is going to be the best. Because your personal development plan, which is the next stage of the development cycle, has to be linked to the SID. So you're all about treating the causes, not the symptoms, yeah? Is it a knowledge piece? Is it a skills piece? Is it an attitudinal piece? What do I need to do to, put, to, do, to address the underlying cause of that misfire in terms of performance? <clears throat> and the other thing that it needs to be linked to is their learning style. Yeah, which I'm going to talk to, to you about in, in a moment. So the personal development plan, yeah, <clears throat> needs to be really clear. Yeah, what's the performance gap? Where are they now? Where, they need, where do they need to be? Can you explain that to them? Can you demonstrate that to them if needs be? Yeah, use quantitative and qualitative data, hard and soft facts from within the SIP process. Share with them what you found it shouldn't be a secret you know this is this is what we've ascertained part of our kind of look into your, your performance <clears throat> be crystal clear with what's expected of them in terms of their performance standards and how it's going to be measured <clears throat> and be realistic yeah so when you're measuring and calibrating them you know, if you've, if you've got somebody who's relatively new to the role, you need to be careful about setting them performance criteria that are realistic. So have smart, you know, in terms of your objective setting, specific, measurable, is it achievable? Is it realistic? Can it be done in a timely way? So with some people, <clears throat> although you're an expert, you're a supervisor, you're a coach, you know they're at a four out of 10, and you know your minimum standards for them to be effective is an eight out of 10. It may be appropriate, and this is where your judgment and discretion comes into place, to say, okay, in my view, knowing this individual like I do, that's too broad a gap, yeah? What I'm going to do is set them criteria around six. I'm gonna tell them there's more work to do, but I'm gonna go, this is, this is the next step for you. Then once we've mastered that, we're going to move on again because you're using your professional acumen and expertise to say, you know what, it's too big a leap. Yeah. Uh, and that is something that, again, in my experience, some supervisors have been uh, reluctant to do because they see that as a sign of weakness. I actually see that absolutely as a sign of strength and applying your professional acumen to saying that would probably uh, destroy uh, the confidence of the individual. And once confidence is gone, that's a hell of a battle to kind of bring them back on board and, and get them where you need to be. And again, just making sure that any interventions are as aligned as possible to day-to-day -day activities. What we don't want to do is to get them bogged down, you bogged down, with duplication, extra administration. So where are the opportunities to weave development into day-to-day -day business 
activities. <clears throat> and then you've got to decide exactly, you know, what you're going to do in terms of the best development intervention. So you've identified the cause, you've applied SID and said, right, this is what's causing this. I'm going to have framed a personal development plan. Is it, is it a knowledge piece? Is it something that I can just simply train them in? I can tell them about it, I can show it them. Um, I can get them on a course, I can do it one to one. I can get somebody else within the business to do that. <clears throat> is this more of a behavioral piece? Is this a skills application that needs some, some work? So to what extent do I need to demonstrate what good looks like to them? Is that something that I do myself? What are the resources within the business that I can draw on to help me get them crystal clear on the sort of standards we're expecting around here as, as a minimum? And what better than that looks like in terms of our gold standard? Yeah. How am I going to observe them? Am I going to do a full meeting, part of a meeting? Is it going to be a role play? Is it going to be explained to me? Is the role play going to be with you, with somebody else? Yeah. <clears throat> Is it going to be with a live client? Yeah. Am I going to bring somebody in from outside the business? Yeah. And that's something I've done in the past where we've had an advisor who we didn't want to um, use one of the live clients with. We actually brought somebody in to play the role of a client from outside the business, which worked really well, actually. <clears throat> and then to give them some feedback on where they are now, the standard they've just achieved, and if necessary, where they, they need to be. <clears throat> and then at the top of the, uh, the learning curve, if you like, is, you know, this is probably with your more experienced advisors who um, are working clearly in an efficient and effective way. But you need to morph into more of a mentor there. So you're more of a, um, an equal, you're a sounding board, you share ideas, you brainstorm with them, you look at joint initiatives, you look at ways, you know, it's a great phrase in development, you don't have to be able to get better. So highly effective advisors, in my experience, a lot of them um, want, you know, really value the kind of mentoring relationship. Um, and again, that's part of what I do in my consultancy business. I work with effective advisors and business owners who want some challenge, you know, want a sounding board who can be objective and independent um, with them to, to drive the business on because they're passionate about being the best they can be from a business perspective. <clears throat> and then the other thing is uh, tailoring the demo plan to how people learn. So. Remember what I said as part of my intro really, that, you know, we will have typically, if we're a supervisor, a, a team of people, a squad of people. Uh, one thing I can absolutely guarantee, everybody will be slightly different within your team. Some will be chalk and some will be cheese and you'll have every kind of uh, shade in between that. Um, so the skill of being a supervisor is to know and understand people as well as you can, but also when we're framing development uh, intervention, to understand how they learn, yeah? Uh, and you're probably familiar with, because of your role, something called COLD and how people learn. This is fairly well embedded. This, this uh, research goes right back to the 60s. It's very well proven. Um, so there are some people who really learn by doing. So the, the label there is activists. So they, um, they, they just want, if, if you, you know, they just want to try it and get, get feedback, yeah? They get bored with kind of uh, just reading books or theoretical exercises. It's, let's roll my sleeves up, let's get on with it. Uh, the newer, the better. You know, the value, the, the, the value excitement. <clears throat> and, you know, you'll know these people in their team. They're up for anything. Yeah, I'll try anything once. That's a, that's a clue to if you want to work them from a development perspective, get them doing something, get them doing a role play, get them doing a quiz, get them going to see something so they, they feel that they're in it. Yeah. You'll have other people in your, your team who uh, will want to check out 
what you're saying to them. You know, they want to say, oh, it's interesting you say that. What, you know, um, what's the theory behind that? Why are you telling me this? Yeah. Um, but they are pragmatic. They will want to solve issues. Yeah. They see issues as, as challenges, problems to be overcome. Um, they're not very esoteric. They're normally quite down to earth. So this is where the use of simple language is really important and simple tasks, very practical tasks. If you can show somebody who's more pragmatic that this really works, you know, I'm working within the team, X, Y, Z do this, really works for them, why don't you try it? They're probably going to give it a go. Yeah, if it works, it's good. I'll give that a bash. <clears throat> Reflectors, you'll have some reflectors in your team. And I'm smiling because uh, I was working with a reflector yesterday who would really want to do anything but actually get on and do it. You know, asking lots of questions, procrastinating. Could you show me that again, Jeremy? Uh, ask you some more questions. Have you got a video I can watch before I actually do it? And you think, oh, well, you know what? Just, just do it. They're very cautious. Um, and, you know, you need to uh, get into a place where you say, you know what, you're just going to have to get on and do it now. The time for talking's over. Eventually, you do need to roll your sleeves up and get on and do it. <clears throat> and then you've got your people who really, it's all about theory for them. Yeah. So tell me why I should do this. Where has it worked in the past? And I'm not just interested in this business, show me some something else from outside the business, show me the proof, yeah? <clears throat> and they're quite logical, yeah? Quite logical in their, uh, their thinking. Uh, and if it's logical, if you can make the A, B, C, D links for them, lay it out and show them some external validated evidence from CII or any other kind of professional body, they're more inclined to believe it and go with it. So what? So what that means is that uh, not only do you have to identify the causal effects, when you're framing the development plan, you need to think about making that plan clear and explicit uh, around performance gap and trying to tailor it so it is aligned to how people learn. So if, if you've got the activist pragmatists in your team, they're the people who want to get on and do it. Yeah, the reflectors, they're more, and, um, and theorists, they're more likely to want to think about it. So again, it's a great challenge for, uh, for a supervisor because you will have a mixture. And these are all primary styles. In reality, we're all a bit mix of these, but you'll know the ones who are quite happy to just give it a bash and those who are, a lot more reticent. And this is why it's their underlying preferences to how they learn. So <clears throat> armed with that knowledge, you can uh, devise uh, strategies and development information, uh, interventions that um, appeals to them. But ultimately, it is about getting on and, uh, and getting something done in terms of development, which is what we're going to, uh, <clears throat> to look at now. Now, I'm not going to um, kind of insult your intelligence and your uh, experience by talking about training because you're all the expert trainers. As I said, I'm sure any one of you could be running this workshop here this morning. What I am going to do, though, as I said at the introduction, is I am going to major in on uh, coaching, you know, Coaching, passionate about coaching, it's the biggest gift you can bring to a business in terms of driving business development, creating great client outcomes and helping your team fulfil their potential. Yeah. <clears throat> when you read wider than just financial services and you read into things um, around coaching, it, be, it becomes particularly clear that elite performance, the most important person in their life, is, is their coach. Um, and I would suggest that uh, the most important person in your advisor's professional development journey should be you. <clears throat> and one of the challenges I lay down to the supervisors I work with on a weekly basis is very straightforward. 
I'm self-employed, I run my own business, I only, you know, I get a check at the end if I've done a great job. Yeah. <clears throat> the supervisors I work with are on a salary basis. So I believe that's a very different environment. So the challenge I give them is okay, if at the end of your supervision or coaching session, would the advisor that you're working with be prepared to write out a check because of the quality of the intervention that you've had with them? If the answer to that is no, then you're stealing your salary. Now, that's not addressed to anybody on this particular call. That's a kind of a conversation I have in the employed world in terms of trying to help people understand just how important this is and how expert you need to be at coaching. And I'm sure everybody on the, this call is an expert in, in coaching. And I want to look at one particular process and method of coaching this morning. Uh, and that's performance coaching. So this is where you probably do this out width of just merely the, the mandatory TNC. This is where you're really driving performance along that learning curve for effectiveness around the non-mandatory areas. And you're really using your knowledge, skills and expertise to help somebody truly fulfill their potential. So it's all around skills development. We're encouraging them to grow their business through delivering fantastic client outcomes. The flip side of that is your business is going to be growing as well. <clears throat> and I always say to people I'm coaching, you know, your mind works best when it's like a parachute. Yeah. So it needs to be open. Are they open? Are they prepared to open their mind to new possibilities, to alternative ways of working that they will actually generate for themselves. Because the way, as you know, to motivate anybody to make any sort of changes, particularly from a behavioral point of view, is to get them to own their own development. And key to owning their own development is to get them to identify areas that they want to work on and why, in what ways that that aligns to their goals. So performance coaching is all about assessing and understanding current performance and then saying right so ideally where would you want to be in the future yeah well, so therefore what is the gap between the two and that's where the kind of coaching kicks in <clears throat> and coaching whether it's for tnc or whether it's performance will always have these three elements in it yeah your needs to be able to demonstrate what highly effective looks like whether it's mandatory or effectiveness you'll be able to you need to be experts at observing and giving feedback why do we need to be experts at demonstrating well sometimes people just can't get it from the use of words alone it just something isn't clicking and you have been in this situation yourselves i'm sure with people that you've coached in the past. So out over and above kind of discussion, it's about saying, okay, let me show you. And you need to be comfortable to say, right, this is what I mean, yeah? So I'm gonna show you what I saw and heard, then I'm gonna show you what I think good looks like, and then we can discuss where the gap is. Also, it isn't always just down to you, yeah? Some of the best learning I've ever had in my career is observing others at work because it's a brilliant opportunity to be outside of a process, to step back, observe and learn from how others approach things. <clears throat> but never forget, as a coach, you need to be prepared to demonstrate not only what you observed, but what is required yourself. Yeah, you can't kind of contract that out. That's a required kind of skill. <clears throat> so building on some of the points we made around T and C, you know, why are we observing somebody? So the purpose is to watch, be that uh, video player, actively listen, really take meticulous notes and evidence the feedback. 
as soon as possible after the feedback. It's about looking at the notes that we've taken, these meticulous notes. <clears throat> we categorize them so we cluster into groups. We become clear through our professional skills and acumen around what the strengths and development points are. And then we're going to go into the feedback process by stating the purpose and overviewing the, uh, the process, all the while being sensitive to feelings. And this is what the uh, positive reinforcement technique actually is, is very alive to. There's lots of um, research that says, you know, <clears throat> the only way that people respond positively to coaching is, is in a safe environment, which you think that through is, is kind of common sense, really. They don't want to feel it's, um, it's a threatening environment in any, in any sense. And the way to do that is to get the feelings out on the table and to be structured through use of an agenda. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, uh, I'm sure some of you already know and maybe even use this positive reinforcement coaching technique. It is widely used in the financial services sector. If you don't, it really doesn't matter as long as you've got a coaching track that you follow each time. So to bring out consistency in your process, <clears throat> the positive reinforcement uh, technique is more aligned to um, skills, but it can equally be effectively used for TNC coaching as well. So the very first step in the process <clears throat> is if you remember those uh, boxes we saw with our preparation, et cetera. So we need to, before we even start the observation uh, and then move on to coaching, I would suggest establish the objective of uh, the review and the benefits to advisor. What that does then is when we start the coaching process, we've got that as a link. So we go back to that and we just remind the advisor why we were here to do this coaching session today. What was the objective? And critically, what did the advisor see as the benefits to them of you going through this coaching process with them? <clears throat> and then it's about dealing with how they're feeling right here, right now. So how do you feel it went? And that, and that you know, um, some people are quite reticent to start to talk about, you know, that they want to go, oh, well, I feel it went all right. Well, what do you mean by all right? You've got to, you've got to, um, some people say, well, I thought it was rubbish. It's not like I would normally do it. I think I felt under pressure because it was a role play and I was being observed. Okay, I don't understand how you feel like that. You know, other people have felt like that too. But what they found is, as a result of coaching, so with that in mind, bear in mind it's a safe environment, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Once we've kind of dealt with the feelings and kind of addressed that, um, we move into what they thought went well. And again, my experience has been that some people struggle to identify. I don't know if it's part of kind of our um, our cultural kind of psyche in the in the UK that we we not we don't want to big up our our performance, but most people. Uh, I've had coaching interactions with in the past. They're really good at telling me all the things that they thought didn't go so well. Uh, they've got a long list of those, but they struggle more to, uh, to identify what did go well. But <clears throat> don't let them off the hook here. You know, if somebody says, well, no, well, it wasn't one of my best, actually. I think it was quite average. So I wasn't particularly pleased with any, everything, anything that went on there. <clears throat> uh, you know, the temptation of an unskilled coach is to say, oh, well, I've got a problem here then, so I'll move on. But I think that's the point to hit the brake pedal and say, well, it's, that's interesting to say that because I've actually got lots and lots of examples here of things I thought were absolutely excellent. So let me just remind you of one of those. Da, 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 da. Okay, so building on that then, as I said, that was one of numerous, dozens of examples I've got of things that went well. Well, else did you think that went well? And then that will encourage them to get the drift that uh, this isn't going to be moving on. <clears throat> They'll tell you um, what they did well, and then you can, again, positively reinforce that. Yes, you're right. This is what I heard. This is what I saw. This is what happened at part of the meeting. Uh, this is what the client's reaction was to that, blah, blah, blah. 
meticulous notes, and then summary. And the reason I put the summary in red there is from a best practice point of view, this is where you get your Koji to replay back to you what went well. Yeah. <clears throat> So you throw it over to them. Okay, so we've just spent the last five or 10 minutes talking about all the brilliant things that went on there. We started off with, uh, with this, then you contributed. So just summarize that back to me. Overall, give me, uh, give me a paragraph while everything that you've, we, we've identified went really well for it was highly effective in that meeting and get them to play it back to you. Checks that they are understanding what's been said, but also encourages them to, to start to believe and get to buy in. Because positive reinforcement is about reinforcing the strengths as well as the development areas. You can, it's easier as a coach, as you know, to work on strengths. So if somebody's naturally good at something, it's easier to get a bit of incremental uh, change and improvement from them. Uh, and that will take their overall level of performance up. So that's totally legitimate kind of coaching technique. However, we do also have to focus on the development areas. So inevitably, there will be development areas. Now, again, <clears throat> my experience has been <laughs> that most people are very good. They're very kind of self-reflecting and uh, analytical and sometimes overly critical of themselves in an assessment or coaching situation. <clears throat> Sometimes though, people are off the curve and they believe that their performance is better than it is. Uh, I guess there's a few wry smiles on the course now with individuals you either currently or have worked with in the past who probably score themselves a 10 out of 10 and you're looking at a six out of 10 and they think they're uh, you know, there's very little you can do to uh, to help them or tell them how to be better. And again, that's where you feed in. Well, there were several things actually where I felt that uh, based on other uh, effective advisors I'm working with, where you were below uh, where you need to be, I'll share one with you. That normally start to confront the issue with a small C and bring them back down onto that learning curve in a non-threatening and aggressive way. <clears throat> but they will normally share. Uh, issues with you. As I say, the, the thing to do there is remember what we were talking about earlier, about making sure we maintain the balance <laughs> because you know, they, they probably got half a dozen, a dozen things they can reel off and that is to like make sure they don't beat themselves up. So once they've given you a couple of things, you can kind of draw a little line there and say, yes, you agree, reinforce that, uh, build, build on that if you want to with anything that you want to uh, contribute, particularly if you feel that it's, uh, you know, they've uh, come up with a couple of development areas where really that wouldn't be your number one priority, because in your professional judgment, if they could work on another area, that would actually give them, from a developmental point of view, a bigger bang for their book in terms of uh, what's going on. And again, in a similar vein, get them to play back to you. So what, what have we just talked about there? What do we think went less well? And then it's a case of setting priorities. Yeah. And it's about, as I said, people can't, haven't got the capacity to work on too many development points, particularly when you're addressing skills and behaviors. So it's a case of trying to identify a couple of priority areas to improve on. Yeah. Now, ideally, these, um, these priority areas are going to come from the coachee themselves. <clears throat> and sometimes it probably isn't the priority areas that you would have um, you would have gone with, but that doesn't matter, providing it's not a TNC issue, it's mandatory and has to be fixed. If this is about development and they've come up with these two areas, much more likely that they own it and are committed to it and will get on and actually do something about it. And then you can keep your powder dry and come back. Yeah. <clears throat> In terms of action planning, it's about at that stage generating some options with them. Yeah. And getting them to think through what would be the best um, interventions, the best courses of action 
to help them improve in those two areas that have been identified. And then going back to, um, to what we were saying earlier about how you, you know, evaluate the final part of the needs analysis, the development cycle, what are they actually going to do differently then? So this is what we saw, this is what we heard. We said that you need to work on that, we need to improve that area. How will we know what's going to be different? So if I were to come back and observe you in a month's time, focusing in on these two priority areas, what would I hear? What would I see that would be different? And it would be that sort of base level that we need to get to so it's crystal clear from them. <clears throat> And then it's about, okay, so if that's the case, what do you need from me? You know, in what way can you facilitate that? And that's not to take the issue off their back, to catch the, uh, catch the problem at all. This is, you know, part of my role is I can facilitate assistance if you require it. Might be, you know, as I say, observing a colleague, yeah, sitting with another uh, person within the, uh, the firm. So what's your role? in all of this. And then <clears throat> this isn't just a one-off exercise, yeah? So they're gonna be working on a couple of areas. They're gonna try and do things differently. They're identifying how that's gonna be in terms of a plan of attack. How can we make sure that becomes embedded? What can we do to make sure that the improvements that you're working on get embedded into the way that you work so that development area starts to move from a development area to hopefully one of your key strengths. <clears throat> so that is the uh, that is the kind of the concept of um, performance coaching and positive reinforcement. And then again, just from my observations, uh, of, of watching people coach and then giving them feedback, some kind of do's and don'ts. And I'll just um, skate through these relatively quickly because I don't want to uh, kind of insult your intelligence uh, or labor points. <clears throat> but in terms of at the start of, of the meeting, obviously make sure you spend time with the, uh, the coaching just to reframe why we're here, what's the purpose of the meeting, objectives, uh what are the benefits of that and just to overview the feedback process so what's going to happen is it shouldn't be a surprise and then you know as we saw on that track how did that meeting go for you how are you feeling during it <clears throat> so you know equally i'm not going to go through that it's just the uh the reverse of that would be yeah would be something to avoid and why you might be looking at that slide and smiling and thinking it would never be me um as recently as as this week i saw somebody kind of file straight into a, a coaching session um didn't use an agenda didn't overview the process um and just kind of cracked on with it really thought okay interesting approach <clears throat> When you're getting into the kind of the meat of the, uh, the session, then the wells and less wells and playing back what you observe, um, you know, make sure you, you follow that that track, yeah. Uh, so so that gives you structure to the meeting, which is really really important. Uh, never always be on broadcast mode. I, I'm on broadcast mode this this morning, and I know how uh, uh, tiring that that can be for the people on the end, end of that, but actively listen, build on their points, question them a little bit further, you know, use open questions around, okay, interesting, what happened there? Why did it happen? You know, how did that work? Be as descriptive as you can in your feedback. Don't just be a, um, a, a rollover, you know, challenge and confront, but in a, in a positive and developmental way, you know. So it's interesting you should say that. I didn't actually see that, that's not what I heard. Let me tell you what I saw, what I think the impact on the client was, yeah? So, yeah, in, interesting, but I'm not, I'm not rolling over for that, you know. Um, what are the key development needs? As I say, keep the balance of, of negatives and positives. Should be a, um, you know, praise sandwich, really. <clears throat> and again, the, the negatives of that would be the, uh, 
the, the opposite really. And again, um, surprisingly, I've seen this happen as well, where you know the positives have hardly ever been uh, been talked about. We've gone kind of skiing off piste on some sort of an esoteric peripheral item that I was sitting there thinking, well. I don't know why we're spending time talking about this. There's, there's three or four things that um, are far more important. And this is where it's important not to be prescriptive and, uh, and subjective as well. And as you get in towards that stage where you're encouraging them to, uh, to generate their own options in terms of what they want to do differently and how they're going to do it, that's at the point where you should encourage them to be noting down the key points. Yeah, make their own notes. They shouldn't just rely on you as, as the, uh, the only note taker in the meeting. Yeah, and where appropriate, you know, to say meeting, give it structure, summarize and control the meeting, use summaries to emphasize the key points. Keep it, keep it structured. Don't allow a coach to just say, well, could you give me a copy of your notes afterwards? No, you need to make your own notes in your own way, highlight the things that are important to you. These are very much working notes for my use and it wouldn't mean that much to you. Challenge and confront with a small C. <clears throat> in terms of getting down to uh, putting the rubber on the road, really, in terms of actions and the PDPs, what are the benefits? What are the priorities? Making sure that the plan that you're going to frame actually meets the objectives. Draw on all the ideas that they've got and you know, refine them with them as necessary to get right down into the detail of the plan. And then what's critical to do is to link those actions to the benefits of taking those actions. Because once you leave that room, with the coachee, as you know, it's kind of down to them. You want them to own the problem, to own the issue, and you're not going to be working with them uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis on it. You will obviously be checking in and making sure that they're actually in their plan, but if they are motivated because they can see the benefits of it, they're far more likely to, uh, to get on and, uh, and do it. And again, the don'ts would be, Probably the exact opposite of all of that. <clears throat> so what we've been what we've been doing here is looking at the, the skills of uh, of a coach around kind of uh, driving for uh, for development and helping people fulfil their potential. In terms of embedding performance, we. Uh, <clears throat> need to be clear about how we assess performance. So once you've framed a plan of action, make sure that everybody's very clear about what's going to be happening, what's going to be um, monitored. Do your objectives pass the SMART test, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound? Could you tick each one of those? And who owns what? Who's responsible for what? Yeah. <clears throat> How is the performance of the individual going to be assessed and calibrated against those standards that have been set? And as I say, take account of the experience of the advisor and whether you want to lose live meetings or role plays. Again, the good news from your perspective, I guess, uh, being members of IFAC means you have access to a whole um, host of resources on that, that system. So if you go into the same place under the documentation piece there, uh, you'll find a whole load of uh, role plays that you can use and uh, observation aids throughout all the different kind of categories, whether it be uh, mortgage, investment, protection, et cetera. Um, if you've not looked at it already, I really recommend it. It's very much uh, worth looking at, as is the guide for supervisors. So again, I was looking at that earlier on in the week. It's a, it's a brilliant guide. If you've not looked at it, have a look at it. It's got all the kind of um, forms uh, and it, it talks to a lot of the um, 
uh, material we've been talking about this uh, this this morning. So I would heartily recommend both of those resources that uh, that you're able to access. <clears throat> And just now, just uh, finally, for the final 15 minutes of the, uh, the workshop, I'm just going to look at the final part of the key elements, that bottom strand, which is about managing relationships, developing people to develop the business. Yeah. So <clears throat> really, really important uh, skill for a supervisor because you can't really coach, you can't really do your TNC can't really be an effective supervisor without building and maintaining great relationships across the firm. So it goes without saying, in the first instance, you need to be skilled at rapport building and looking for common ground with people who's, who's we've seen uh, in this session have very different uh, drivers, motivations, personality styles. So uh, you'd be near, you need to be able to flex your approach with different uh, personality styles to build uh, common ground. It's about, I guess, treating others like you want to be treated yourself, fairly common sense. So having good manners, being open and honest at all times. I would add on to that being consistent in your, uh, your approach, uh, whether it be a Monday morning or last thing on a, on a Friday, consistent in your approach, your outlook, and consistent across the team with how you work with your people. And be specific, be very clear about what your role is, what their role is, what your expectations are. So it's about, I guess, being professional, but most of all, people by people who are themselves. <clears throat> Super, being a supervisor, as I said at the start, is one, I believe, one of the hardest roles within financial services to, to do it effectively and properly. And it's difficult to be a supervisor if you are trying to play a role. Yeah, you have to be ultimately be yourself because the hours are long, the expectations high, there's a lot of stresses and strains in the role. So you need to be yourself, you need to be authentic. And people will buy in, as you know, to people who are authentic. <clears throat> so in terms of building rapport and being able to flex your style, um, you need to understand yourself, uh, but you also need to understand others as well. So we all see the world in a slightly different way. Yeah, so our perception of the world will be shaped by lots of different things. Our, upbringing, our education, our further education, our early work life experiences, family, friends, etc, etc, peer groups. Yeah. So <clears throat> and our, our perceptions are shaped over over time. And that actually um, frames how we, we behave, how we behave in the world. Our behaviors are kind of a, a result of our drivers, our values and beliefs, which have been shaped by how we perceive the world. <clears throat> and there's a very simple and straightforward uh, tool that you can use just to help you do some categorization of your team, the individuals within the team. And maybe you recognize some of this yourself. Just, just three elements to it. There are some people who are tough battlers, some are friendly helpers and some are logical thinkers. What do we mean by that? <clears throat> so you may have somebody in your team who's, who is very action orientated. Um, they've got lots of drive, got lots of confidence in themselves. They are quite, you know, status orientated. You know, they'd have um, uh, pictures of things that they've won or things that they aspire to, whether it be the car, the house, they really want to win. They want to do things their way. They're kind of, you know, that way inclined. Uh, I had a meeting with the owner of a firm a few weeks ago. He had all sorts of cups and trophies from his uh, sporting days. And he actually had a pair of um, boxing gloves framed in a, in a case, in a cabinet, 
yeah, because he very much wanted everybody to see that he had achieved and now he was setting out to achieve business in the same way that drive energy and that commitment. <clears throat> Friendly helpers, they are evident because, you know, within your team, you'll have people, and these are very helpful to identify as a supervisor because they're very good at wanting to keep uh, relationships um, harmonious. So they're good, they're a good, um, you know, personality type to have on board in terms of a team mix. They're very much into the we rather than the I. They believe in teamwork. They want to work in positive, uh, harmonious teams. And then you've got people who are more down the logical thinker route, uh, and they are very kind of structured uh, and logical, as their name would suggest. They don't, you know, you, you'd see them from their desks really being probably paperless, um, very much to-do list orientated, and that kind of thing. It's all about structure, order, truth for them. Um, don't tell me stories. They, you know, tough battles maybe they like stories and anecdotes and stuff. They just want, just tell me how it is, basically. <clears throat> so each one of those is is slightly exaggerated to, um, to to just talk to. In reality, what you will find is that the people, either yourself as the uh, the supervisor. Or the people within your team will be a blend of those but it will be a unique blend in terms of maybe what their uh, key um, preferences in terms of their personality style and, and the other elements they're coming from that helps you kind of read them read the sorts of relationship that might work best between you and them and how you might need to flex your style to make sure that you and they are getting the best from the relationship. <clears throat> and you can actually predict how the different personality styles might potentially interact with each other. Yeah. So friendly helper down the bottom uh, left, that triangle, sees a tough battler, somebody at the top of the apex there, somebody who's really strong and committed, you know, and will get things done. But maybe on the negative side, maybe a little bit arrogant, maybe a little bit self-centered, yeah? Tough battler, on the other hand, sees the friendly helper as you know, not particularly a threat, but they're good to have around, yeah? They're good for team morale, but maybe they're a little bit too soft and trusting and they, they, they're quite easy to push around. <clears throat> so I'm not going to kind of dwell on, on that slide. It's just saying that, if you can identify different personality styles within your teams, you'll be able to predict with a high degree of certainty how you're going to interact and get along together. <clears throat> the final thing I want to talk about this morning in terms of managing effective relationships is just to make sure your time is really valuable. Um, you know, you've got to make sure that your time and the time of the team is spent on delivering outcomes, which will help everybody move forward, make sure you hit the objectives of the business. <clears throat> so this is about when we talk about contracting with people. So it doesn't have to be written down, but basically it's just an agreement about how you're going to work together and what you expect from each other. So it could be what we've been talking about in terms of a coaching process or taking them through the TNC process. It's just, this is what I expect of you. What do you expect of me? That's how we're going to work together then. This is the action plan, yeah? How we're going to work together. You can, be work, you can use a contract for a whole variety of different things, TNC, coaching, even if you're setting people tasks to do or giving them projects to do, you can sit down and have a session with them that's really clear about how, what your expectations are, how you're going to work together, what the timeframes are. Can be formal, can be informal, can be written, can be verbal. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to put things in writing because you know it brings it to life and makes it more important and real. 
Now, one of my favorite consultancy questions with supervisors is, do you have contracts with, uh, with the people? And a lot of them say, no, no, we just, just all done on trust and we do action plans and this, that and the other. I say, that's interesting. Because even if you don't think you've got a contract, you normally have, but it's more of an implicit contract. Yeah, so it's an impl implication. So, you know, if you don't do this, then this will happen. If you do do this, then this will happen. It's never actually said between the two of you. It's kind of uh, hidden, implicit, uh, but there will be a contract in place. So you need to be alive to that and recognize it and verbalize that and get that on the table. Yeah. So try and make all, all working agreements explicit. Yeah. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this in your, in your onboarding and induction process at this point, <coughs> this is expected you will reach competent advisor status. This is what you need to do. This is how you will be measured. This is how the feedback process work. Yeah. <clears throat> so a good contract should be like a good plan, really. Measurable objectives, time scales, who's responsible for, for doing what. Interestingly, what each party doesn't have authority or responsibility for or doesn't have to do. Very um, useful when you're saying somebody some project work or task to do. And equally important is kind of, you know, how you need to behave, what the standards are and how often uh, we're going to be reviewing this, uh, this contract, this piece of work together, what the process is, what the timelines are and how we're going to communicate with each other and what authority that they've got. Again, you know, what's their authority? What's your authority? How do the boundaries work? Again, very useful when you're setting people tasks and project work. <clears throat> Well, you've got a contract or an agreement, a working agreement in place. It's really useful because it gives you the right as the supervisor manager to get on and manage their performance, to monitor them. It's really a good tool for confronting them with a small C if their performance slips, they miss deadlines, they don't do what's expected. And it creates a sense of ownership, not just from you, but from the other party or parties that are involved in the process. And if you've got the right level of measures in there with the right frequency, you can check how it's working and make sure it's on track. And it avoids any misunderstandings where you, you've communicated something very clearly to somebody, but for whatever reason, it's not happened. Yeah, it typically comes back to the fact that the working agreement wasn't well articulated at all, understood by both parties and what the expectations were. And it removes that, well, I didn't think that's what you'd asked me to do. I didn't think that was my job. You know? And that's the real strength of putting that down in, uh, in writing. Okay. And it's the ability to learn uh, from how you're tracking it, et cetera. If you don't have a contact in place, then what can happen is because of misunderstandings, relationships can break down. Where that happens, obviously people tend to become demotivated they associate that with kind of failure, lack of direction, and people tend to take a step back. They try and abdicate responsibility, maybe try and blame others. It's a waste of time. Everybody's frustrated. So <clears throat> not a good place to be. So when we're striking working agreements, just keep them simple. Don't overpromise. Keep them reasonable, practical. Um, where any potential roadblocks uh, can be envisaged, make sure that uh, they can be removed, test the motivation of the people that you're working with to take the actions. Talk about benefits as well as consequences of doing what's, uh, what's been agreed, making sure that they're committed. And when necessary, you know, just negotiate, make sure everybody thinks that they're winning from that. <clears throat> okay. So that really, I said it would take a couple of hours and indeed it has. Let's just refresh our memory of um, what we were trying to do this morning over that last couple of hours together. We started off by just refreshing our memory on what the key supervisory skills are. So we said there were six of those that we unpacked to, uh, to, to an extent. We then looked at the key elements of the supervisory role and then we went into 
the key principles of TNC and spent a lot of time in there. <clears throat> then as part of the key elements of supervision, we looked at that SID process, yeah, uh, and said we can use SID, yeah, to help us do a needs analysis, which helps drive the development cycle. So we looked at each of the elements of the development cycle, and then we looked at something called a positive reinforcement technique, coaching. And lastly, we've looked at things like understanding personality styles and contracting to facilitate effective relationships. So that's all good stuff. What I'm going to do now is um, we've talked about CPD. For those of you on the call who would like a uh, certificate to evidence your attendance this morning, then uh, there's my uh, contact details up on the screen now. So take a screenshot or a photograph or scribble it down on, uh, on a piece of paper. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Mahali. That's very nice of you to, uh, to say so. Um, so I'm very conscious that uh, we've been on the line two hours. And I've got to say thank you for your stamina for staying with it. Um, <clears throat> I've not even drunk a whole glass of water, which I think is a, a good from, uh, from a talking perspective. Um, I wish you a uh, good rest of the day. I'm sure your inbox is probably bulging having taken a couple of hours out. Um, if you're around next week for the uh, SMF uh, course on anti-money laundering, I shall be uh, here to take that. So I look forward to seeing you uh, to then. Um, yeah, Jasmine, the, uh, the sessions are recorded. Uh, you'll need to contact um, either Charlie or Peter Hall at IFAC to access the recording of today's session. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let's all go uh, get a, a well-earned um, cup of tea or coffee or whatever. Thank you all. Uh, look forward to seeing you, those of you on next week's course in, in a week's time. Uh, and for now, I'm going to sign off and say uh, thank you for today and goodbye.